Hello. Good afternoon, uh, everyone who's uh, watching us on streaming. Good afternoon, John Boyne, the author of the book that we're presenting today, who is in uh, Dublin to talk with us today. Today is the 28th of June, and today we commemorate uh, LGTBI pride. Now, this is a spontaneous, uh, goes back to a, a, a spontaneous rebellion uh, in uh, 28th of uh, June 1969, when uh, in New York, when a group of transvestites um, were fed up and uh, and rebelled against the, all of the uh, the oppression from the police and the shame, and they decided to take action. I think there are very few novels, in at least in Spanish bookshops, that are better suited to look back on and review all of these uh, this period. What uh, what had been what things have been like. Uh, for the gay community in the last part of the 20th century and the beginning of this century. And I think there are very few uh, novels which are so good uh, as uh, the one we're presenting today, The, the Hearts and Visible Furies uh, by John Boyne. So, John, uh, good afternoon. You're in, you're in Dublin? Yes, um, unfortunately. I wish I was there with you. You're being vaccinated today, no? <laughs> I've got my second coming tomorrow, yes. No, <laughs> oh, right, so not much left. That's one of the uh, few advantages of, uh, of being less young. And now I'm going to do a, a short introduction, and uh, then I'm going to uh, you know, throw you a few questions so then we can have a chat. So John Boyne. Um, is a, an author who started publishing in. Uh, he started. Uh, he published in 2006, The Boy in the, the Striped Pajamas, and since then, uh, all of his novels have been very successful. And he's one of the most read and most loved authored authors around the world. He's been translated into a huge number of uh, languages. He writes for children as well, and for adults, of course. But uh, all of his books are certainly very readable for adults. Now. There's also The Thief of Time, Mutiny on the Bounty, or The House of Special Purpose, uh, certainly noteworthy. But I'm also going to mention some that have a narrative link to this novel that we're presenting today. One of them is, um, is a book in the, uh, that is uh, set in the World War, which is um, The Absolutist. And then there's a history of loneliness which is uh, the first novel in which uh, John Boyne uh, writes about Ireland, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, at least it's fully set in Ireland. And it also looks at a very uh, thorny issue, uh, which is abuse of uh, children by the clergy in Ireland. And now this is very linked to this novel because of the importance of the, the Catholic Church in the, the Hearts Invisible Furies. The, the two novels share uh, this theme now, those of us who are listening to us, uh, I'd like to say that The Hearts Invisible Furies is a wonderful novel. It's uh, 650 pages. I don't remember the last time I read such a long novel so quickly. It's a real page turner. It's, uh, it really grabs the author's attention. It makes them want to, to continue to read. Uh, and it's not just enjoyable, however, it's also a novel that brings us through all different, a whole range of emotions. And it, it's quite transformative uh, to, for the reader. The Hearts Invisible Furies is the last novel uh, published in Spain by John Boyne, but it's not his last novel. <clears throat> He's also published another two, which will be published in Spain, no doubt. And according to his website, in August, He's due to publish a new novel, which, if I'm not mistaken, is about social media in our time. The Hearts Invisible Furies has an almost mathematical structure. There are 11 chapters. 
The first chapter is in 1945, just when Cyril Avery is about to be born. And then there are successive phases uh, right up to 2015. So the main character, we know him when he's seven, when he's 14, when he's 21, in seven year lapses, and so on and so forth, right up to the last chapter. So what does the Hearts Invisible Fury tell us? Well, it talks about uh, an Irish homosexual who has to go through a whole load of uh, difficulties, oppression, and uh, throughout his life. Now, it's, uh, it's about a learning. It's also about uh, a, a classical hero uh, set up, who, a hero who has to face up to challenges in order to be able to reach some kind of uh, goal. Now, there are three main parts. The first part is called shame. The second part is called exile. And the third part is called peace. So I believe then that the reader is quite clear that we're going from shame on a journey towards peace uh, and moving through exile. So we've got from being hidden to a sense of serenity. And this change in the, uh, in the mindset of the main character is uh, what we're going to talk about today, this transformative process. The, and uh, there's a, it's, it's very intelligent uh, a novel. And it, it's got, there's a lot of irony in it. There are also, there's the betrayals, abandonment, um, and great hope. The, the characters go through all the highs and lows of life and all the and the author really treats this with a great mastery and uh, and I felt very envious uh, seeing the, the great style and, and technique with which he writes this now it begins with the mother uh, giving the child up for adoption so right from the beginning we know that the the, the mother and the, and the son are going to re-encounter. Re this is not a spoiler. This is something that's clear in the novel from the beginning. But what we don't know is just how complex and, and what everything that the lives go through before this re-encounter takes place. The narrative generosity of John Royne is, is wonderful. He wrote a novel in which there would be material for 11 novels. Each chapter could have been a standalone story or novel. It has agile, solid narrative, and there's a, a thematic center to it that, it, uh, that seems to stand alone for each section. Now, um, Boyne has a wonderful way of telling stories, and it's a, it's a great pleasure for readers to, to read this novel. Now, at some stage, the author wants to be very clear that this is an Irish novel. But it's quite clear that this is also a universal novel. Lives of homosexuals in the second half of uh, the 20th century and in the beginning of the 21st century, I think, is quite similar around the world, regardless of where they live. And most experiences are very recognizable and I think that uh, I think that in Spain we certainly recognize this now the main character is homosexual it talks about conflict fear adversity of being homosexual but it's certainly uh, not a novel that can only be read by uh, by homosexuals of course not there are so many stories in this novel that any a reader can find stories and people that they can identify with. And secondly, the Hearts Invisible Fury talks about the search for identity and love. This search that all of us uh, do in our lives, wherever we are in the world. And so I think this can be related to by, by any reader and any person who who's alive. <laughs> so John, it's been a great pleasure and a great honor to be able to uh, present your novel uh, to Spanish readers. And now perhaps you could start by talking about this beautiful title, The Heart's Invisible Furies. What are these furies? Uh, well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Um, 
I, I found that line uh, in a quote by the philosopher Hannah Arendt, who was speaking of the poet W.H. Auden. And if any of you have seen pictures of Auden in later life, he had a, a skin disease that made his skin um, very wrinkled. And she said that he had the hearts and invisible furies carved onto his face. And it struck me very much when I was reading this because um, I was writing this novel at the time and I thought so much of it is really about uh, that, that phrase really kind of sums up so much of mm. Cyril's life. Um, he, he is, his, his life is invisible in many ways because uh, Irish society does not want to see or recognize that there are gay people there. Um, he's on a constant search for love and he's angry about, you know, how society has um, not welcomed him in. So it was one of those moments where you find a line and you think, that's the title. And um, I wrote it down immediately. Yes, I think it, it's a, a very good, def it defines very well the emotional journey of the main character. Now, when I speak to authors, I like to ask them about uh, food, uh, the, um, or the, 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 the kitchen, the, the, the sort of culinary preparation of the novel. So I'm wondering how this preparation took place, uh, this literary uh, uh, cooking. How did it begin? If, if it, it was there in your mind uh, for a long time? It, it, was, it was a couple of things. You mentioned um, my earlier novel, History of Loneliness and that being my first novel to be set in Ireland. And, you know, it had taken me so long to get to a place where I felt I could write about Ireland that by the time I finished that book, I felt I still had so much that I wanted to write about and so many stories I wanted to tell. And this was around the time when the equal rights marriage referendum was about to take place in Ireland. It was about a year off from that. And it seemed obvious that that referendum was going to be passed and that we would have gay marriage in Ireland. And I was thinking about the fact that, you know, 20, only 22 years earlier, when I had been in university, uh, homosexuality had still been uh, a criminal offence, in fact, in Ireland. So in the, you know, in 22 years, which is the blink of an eye in historical terms, we were going from um, a criminal offence to the first country in the world to actually vote by public vote, um, for equal rights marriage. And I wanted to investigate that to understand what can turn a country so much from being so conservative to being a much more liberal place. So it started there. Um, and then when I started writing it, uh, I had the idea of these seven year leaps because I knew this was going to be quite a long book. It was going to be a story of one person's life from birth, you know, right up to, to old age. And um, it just seemed convenient for me to kind of tell it in the way that you mentioned there as kind of self-contained chapters. Um, they do say that every seven years we shed our skin completely and, you know, have a new body of skin. And, um, and so I, I thought about it in that way, that um, in every seven years, Cyril would be almost uh, a, a new version of himself. Yes, and now I'd like to actually read a few things here. I'm going to present it with a few texts. Now, I said this at the beginning, and you've repeated this, that the novel is about Ireland, and it's quite clear that it is related to Ireland. One of the uh, characters says at one point, the Irish, I've never liked the Irish. It's a degenerate race. No one talks about sex, and yet they don't think about anything else. I think there's no nation on the face of the earth that is more obsessed with this issue. And later, towards the end, there's a very significant dialogue between two characters. That's what Ireland is like. Do you think this place could change someday? One of them asks. And the other replies, no, not while we're alive, not in our lifetimes. Now, John, you know that it's uh, changed a lot. Uh, but, yeah, and I think you, you also know that Spain is similar in that respect. Both countries 
were seen as the the spiritual reserve of uh, of of Europe, of the West. You know, like in the the Franco's era, the, these the old uh, uh, Catholic values in Spain c completely dominated the country and controlled um, social morality. And I read the other day that in 1980. They, were, they did a, a, a survey, and it's, it seemed that 80% of Spaniards were completely against homosexuality, and more than 80% wanted it to be banned. However, now Spain is one of the most tolerant countries in the world. Now, as you say in the novel, we were of this generation of gay men who feel lucky just to get to know someone. And Cyril also says, when he sees his, uh, the, his grandchild at the, at the end, what would I not give to be young now and to be able to experience this in, such, in a way without shame and so genuinely? Now, John, do you think that uh, we, we can experience things that way? And now, sometimes I, I have doubts, but I'd like to know your opinion. Uh, don't you think that in the end, both Spain and Ireland uh, have been solved, in a sense. Uh, yeah, in a sense, I do. I, I agree with you that um, they have a lot in common. Um, the, the separation of church and state was not great in the past, and, has, uh, and that has changed a lot in more recent years. And I think it's to the benefits of society and the benefit of its citizens that it's changed quite a lot. Um, you know, one of the things uh, I, I remember when the the day of the equal rights marriage referendum and the television cameras were at various polling stations. And uh, I always remember this elderly man who came out of a polling station crying. And the interviewer asked him, you know, why are you crying? And he said, well, because it's it's too late for me, but it's not too late for others. And I've always had this kind of um, sympathy, I guess, for people who um, just by the nature of when they were born were unable to live their you know authentic lives uh, you know through so much of the hearts invisible furies Cyril's romantic life takes place in the dark um, in you know forests and trees and things and if you grow up feeling that uh, your romantic inclinations can only be pursued in the dark um, then it it makes you feel um, quite bad about yourself, I think. It makes you feel that you are um, dirty in some way. And that's the thing that's changed. And um, I, 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 uh, I look at young people in Ireland today uh, of my nephews and nieces generation, say, and they have no issues with uh, any kind of bigotry at all um, towards anybody, whether it's to do with sexuality or, or, or color or gender or anything you know they're they're they simply wouldn't put up with it and uh, from from what i see of um spain i think it's the same now as well um at least it is when i watch uh, spanish television shows and uh, you know i think that's that's a good thing and uh, again one of the things in this book is to discover you know why what was it that made these things change and for me my answer to that is um, is the church itself is responsible for a lot of it. Because in Ireland, when those scandals started uh, happening or, or being revealed in courts and in newspapers, um, the country kind of turned away from what were the traditional Catholic values and looked at the church as something which had been historically trying to uh, guide people in how to live their lives. And people said, no, actually, I mean, there's, there's so much hypocrisy here there's so much you've betrayed us on so many levels that why are we listening to this so when opportunities came along such as that referenda to to make a statement about who we wanted to be as a people and as a society uh, everybody in Ireland took that took that opportunity now we, we must uh, remember that Ireland was the first country that uh, uh, passed gay marriage through a referendum, not through the judicial system and not through the parliament. 
they, and so they expose themselves to the risk of submitting this to a quite Catholic population by directly asking citizens, which makes this decision even more valuable because in Spain, when uh, equal marriage was uh, passed, there, there was already a majority that were in favor who probably would have said yes. However, uh, there were some doubts uh, about it. And And we could see that, uh, you know, when, um, when equal marriage was, was passed, uh, the people didn't, they, homosexuals didn't have a forked tail and, and breathe fire. Now, I'm going to read three passages that uh, could have been written for me. I identify them with it very much. One says, at the time, homosexuals got what they could wherever they could. And they had to put up with that. Attraction was considered an added value but never a prior requirement. And then there's another phase. I didn't know anything about foreplay or seduction, that what it was like to meet someone in a bar and start a conversation with them while thinking that this could move on to something more interesting. Now, if I wasn't fucking 10 minutes after meeting a man, then it would probably never happen. Now, lastly, the f first six months, I was in, in my bedroom having a wank. And, and then one night, I did it, and I felt so good. As if I'd come to some place for the first time in my life. I'll never forget that feeling, how difficult it was to cross that bridge, as if that were the, the place where I had to be. And that's what it was like. We loved whoever we could. We had a terrible emotional education. And when we finally got to bars, we saw, we discovered a happier world. Now, John, perhaps, you know, this novel has just come out in Spain. Now, perhaps you could talk about the feedback that you've received from Irish readers and English speaking readers in general who, uh, who've been able to enjoy this novel and who've been able to see themselves in it as if it's a mirror to their own lives. Yeah, it, it's, it's been an overwhelmingly positive uh, reaction. It's, it's definitely become my most popular novel after The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Um, it's one that you know, seems to just keep like, selling and selling and people talk about it on um, the internet, on, on Twitter and so on. Um, I think one of the important things in the novel that I want to stress is there's a lot of humor in it that um, while there's many dark passages and Cyril goes through some difficult times, um, there is an awful lot of humor in the book as well. And I think readers have responded well to that and also to Cyril's own character, because I think he's quite a likable person. He makes a lot of mistakes, but he's an optimist and he um, he tends to kind of pick himself up after every disaster that happens to him and just kind of carry on with his life. And uh, people who, who read it t tend to say to me that they just want the best for him. You know, they, they uh, and by him, they mean everybody who's going through that kind of experience. And he represents, at least for me, that generation really before my own, maybe two generations even before my own, um, going through those struggles, but emerging into a much better country. Um, so, I've always been like really proud of the fact that it, it's it, it as you mentioned earlier it's not a book just for gay people it's um it's it's a book that any, anybody seems to be able to enjoy it um it's it's yeah it's it's as i say other than striped pajamas it's it's my most popular book have a lot of uh, people written to you about cyril I've had a lot of letters from elderly people, particularly, maybe sort of, sort of 70 and over, um, who've read the book and really recognized themselves in the experiences and the characters. And I did do a lot of research, you know, of, of, of what life was like for gay people back then. 
And, you know, and I also had my own experiences of, uh, as I mentioned, you know, growing up gay at a time when it was illegal still. And, um, and while, you know, it was a lot easier for me than it was for somebody, say, of my parents' generation, um, there were still difficulties. But I've had a lot of letters from older people who have felt um, that they've been able to recognize themselves in it and that they maybe made some mistakes like, you know, like getting married to somebody when um, they're kind of ruining someone else's life in a way, you know, because uh, like a gay man marrying a straight woman, like she didn't ask for any of that. And um, while it was difficult, like, you know, Cyril makes this mistake in the book as well. And while it's difficult for him, it's, it's hard to kind of uh, sympathize with him causing such damage to another person. Now, I'd like to say something to the readers. Cyril makes that same mistake, but uh, he gets out of it. And But uh, the novel is deliciously funny. Now, I'd, uh, I'd like to focus a little bit more on this aspect of humor, which often is a relief to the anxiety and the emotional burden of the, of the novel. I don't know if uh, that's new in your work, but in other novels, the, some of them that were mentioned at the beginning, such as The Absolutist, and uh, there's a, a more s a serious and dramatic tone and this sort of, this, uh, this way that we can distance ourselves from it through humor, how, was, how did that arise? Yeah, it, it was very important to me at the start because I knew that it was going to be quite a long novel. And I really felt, you know, you cannot ask a reader to stick with you for 650 pages um, and not lighten it up a little bit. Um, I, I just felt very certain of that instinctively at the start but you're right in saying that that's not something that's been in my work before this most of my books have been very um sober i would say and um haven't really lent themselves to humor and i have written before from the perspective of an old man looking back at his life and telling his story but in each of those cases like the absolutist or the house of special purpose um, they've looked back with a great deal of regret and their lives have kind of reached a point where they have felt very unhappy and unfulfilled. And I didn't want that with this, you know, I, because of the subject, I wanted, I, I, I wanted him to, to just be happy for most of the time, even though terrible things are happening to him and he, he can't be his best self all the time that being gay does not automatically mean that he's going to have to be miserable um, all the way through the book. And once I started writing jokes in the second chapter, when he's seven and living with his adoptive parents, um, once those jokes started to come, because the parents are so um, like ridiculous and over the top at times, and Cyril as a seven-year-old is the only kind of grown-up in the house, um, I just felt like it was working. And, you know, as a writer, I think you know when something is working well. And, and that level of humor in that book um, was it was it was fun to write because, you know, I, I like I said about, you know, writing History of Loneliness when I'd never written about Ireland before um, writing a book that has jokes in it. I'd never done that before. And it does kind of free up the brain a little bit. To, to write in a completely different way. Uh, you mentioned the novel that's coming out in the UK in August about social media, um, which is called The Echo Chamber. And that takes a similar path because it is absolutely full of jokes. My plan at the start of that was a laugh out loud line on every single page. Um, and it's, it's, it's good, you know, I mean, like, it's, it's nice to write something funny as a reader, you know, you, sometimes you just feel like you need to read something that's just gonna make you laugh. I'd say that what you achieve in The Invisible Fears of the Heart is that you don't just make people laugh and smile throughout most of the novel, but also to want to 
it gives a desire to really live and to, it creates this empathy with the characters as well through humor. But I, 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 I really, it's interesting, there's this mix of tones and it, it, it creates a very uh, interesting result. It's a novel that doesn't seem to follow any predefined uh, structure. It's risky. And, and alongside the humor, there's brutality. There are some brutal acts that are, are described, such as the uh, Nelson's Column, Destruction of Joe Nelson's Column, which is a tragic story. That, uh, but there are other, you know, there are things we can laugh at, but, but there are other things that are absolutely barbaric, such as there's the, the murder of a baby which the parents didn't want, and as soon as it was born, they drowned it in a barrel. And this is uh, described brutally right from the beginning. Uh, and there's the, the, the death of a, 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 a brother, um, which is, uh, it's a murder. Uh, it's horrendous and cruel. Now, John, uh, now, I certainly think this sort of brutality in a novel uh, which says what it has to say, has certain expressive virtues that can't, do you think they can't be replaced by anything else? Do you think it's necessary? Uh, yeah, I, I, I felt like in the, like the opening chapter of the book is very serious and ends, as you say, in a moment of brutality and there's no lightheartedness at the start. And it's, it's just different moments in his life. Um, you know, we open with a 16-year-old girl being viciously thrown from her parish for the crime of being pregnant and unmarried and being denounced from the pulpit by the priest who himself has fathered two children um, un to the you know unawares of his parishioners um, and the you know the level of hypocrisy that's going on there so yeah and and also because we're moving through time so much by the time it reaches 1987 and the chapter which is uh, explores the AIDS epidemic um, on gay people at that time. Um, you know, these are all important parts of history and that for a gay man, you know, you, you have to write, if you're going to write it through those years, you can't ignore those things. So I did try to balance the two, the, the, the brutality with the humor and it's different points in his life where different elements come through. Um, and maybe it is unusual in the novel to do that, I guess, um, to, but... You know, that's the excitement, I think, of novels, that they can surprise you, both as a reader and as a writer, that y you don't have to keep the same tone all the way through. Yes, well, look, congratulations, uh, because it uh, you achieved it brilliantly. I'd like to talk about that uh, chapter, which you've just mentioned, which is the chapter from 1987, in which... Cyril, at his happiest time, I think. Uh, he's living in New York. And this is during the AIDS uh, epidemic or pandemic, at the most critical time, I believe. And I don't know if you agree uh, that apart from the first chapter, it was perhaps the most uh, anxious, worrying uh, uh, chapter where there's the least sense of hope not just because of the illness but because of other things that are going on in this chapter now here Cyril does something beautiful he as a volunteer he goes to see people in the Monsonai uh, hospital uh, and these are, are patients who aren't being attended by anyone they they just put them aside as if they were you know had the plague and there's a story within that chapter, which I think is really sad. And I think that story would have been, could be a novel unto itself, but I'm not gonna give any spoilers, but perhaps, you know, I, I really urge readers uh, to read this, this novel, even if it's just for this story in three pages, which is really sad. And that story is really enough to justify the novel just on its own. Uh, it's wonderful. 
Now, it also, while I was reading this chapter, chapter it reminded me of what life was like for me, uh, you know, during the, what used to be said about AIDS, all the nonsense that was said back then. Now, um, now, when you read this novel, John, and in general, you know, when you look back and you think about how your life was or how people's lives were around you, do you feel that we've lived most of our life just crushed by delusions, things that just were absolute rubbish, things that really didn't w didn't fit with the Enlightenment? They weren't they weren't nothing. They weren't connected with science, reason, or anything. Do you feel that? Um, well, I don't think I'd, I'd express it in in such um, pessimistic terms, but uh, you know, I I can remember being about fourteen. Um, in the mid 80s when AIDS was at its, um, you know, really at its peak and hearing people on the radio saying things like, you know, all gay people should be gathered up and put on an island somewhere and then, you know, drop a bomb on them, basically. And th these kind of things being actually discussed um, by supposedly civilized people on the national airwaves. And as a teenager thinking, well, is this what's going to happen to me? when I'm a few years older and, you know, am I going to be, am I going to die by the time I'm 25? Um, and, you know, feeling really upset about it and worried and anxious about the whole thing. Um, and I think it's, you know, it, it's become even, it's become even something to talk about now when we've gone through 18 months, basically, of a, a pandemic. And I think young people today, they don't realize how um, enormous the AIDS epidemic was and how many people died. And it's, 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 it's not something that is presented in art as much as it should be. It's not so much there in books or in movies um, or plays, you know. And I think it's time for a reckoning on that, that, you know, we should be talking about it more and remembering those who were lost more. Um, it's kind of strange to me that we're not, but I think because of the the COVID uh, pandemic, we're we're starting to realise that um, you know these things have happened before, and people have been treated in a less respectful fashion um, than they are treated now. But even now with COVID, you'll get deniers, you'll get people who you know refuse to accept science, um, who have no medical training of their own, and yet you know believe nonsense that they read on the internet and pass it off as as fact and you know there's always going to be that element in the world you're always going to have people who simply just refuse to accept the realities of life who you know um you know, just just ignore the science and and you know go down conspiracy theory roads and they would be the very people who would have been the most dangerous i think in the 80s during the aids uh, epidemic. John, in the book, you say that you loved a man whom I also loved. You continue to love this man. I'm not so sure that I would, uh, that I do. Let, let's see a few images now. Can you see the images? I just see us. Who are the images of? No, pues, <laughs> okay, yes. no nos las ponen. Luego volve well, we'll come back to that later. <laughs> ¿Ahora la ves? No. Ah, bueno, ahora, ahora no. Can you see him now? I can. <laughs> yeah. Ah, que sí que la ves, ya. Oh, right, you do. Okay, that's great. Okay. What? <laughs> That was a great surprise. Um, 
¿Qué yeah, piensas uh, de la belleza, John? De, de, de cómo... What do you think about beauty and how we change? Um, that they, they just have like enormous crushes on. And for those who are who do not know who that was, that was Jason Donovan, um, who was a pop star, an actor in the uh, in the 80s, an Australian pop star and actor who I might have had a few posters of my on my wall of, of Jason. <laughs> I think he holds up quite well. The... Would you uh, want to get married still? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm in a relationship now and I'm happy. And um, sure, you know, I, I, I don't think it's the most important thing. I think the important thing is the right to get married. Um, but, you know, I don't necessarily think it's, it's as important to actually do it. Um, but um, I, um, I'm in a, I'm in a happy relationship, and I hope it continues, with or without um, marriage. No, you. Uh, but would you want to marry a Jason Donovan? Uh, would you marry him if he proposed to you? <laughs> I can't answer that. You know, my boyfriend might be watching. <laughs> but yes. Uh, no. Now, I'm not going to uh, ask you this because, I, among other things, you, you, you put that at the end. But how much of there is there of John Boyne in Cyril and in other uh, characters? I'm not going to ask you that directly, but I want to ask you about one particular character. The abducting mother of Cyril is a writer. Her name is Maud Avery. And she's a writer, and she uh, has a, a critical success, but doesn't s sell many novels. Uh, she thinks success is vulgar, and uh, she says that she would... Uh, no. He says he wouldn't want to go out in, in a, a, a kitchen uh, rag. I, I, is that what you have in, in Ireland? Did you invent that? Where you, you have uh, a, a sort of a kitchen towel with photos, or pictures of uh, famous writers? In Spain, you'd never have that. It's a very traditional thing in Ireland. Um, and it, it's sort of on tea towels and calendars and mugs and so on. And it's like the images of like a dozen great Irish writers over the years. And historically... It's always been male writers, you know, like Yeats and Shaw, um, Sean O'Casey, people like that. And there was never a woman on it. And despite the fact that we've had great women writers uh, like, you know, um, Edna O'Brien, Jennifer Johnston and Kent, um, uh, Somerville and Ross and so on. And Lady Gregory. Um, so Maud is she's aware of the fact that the Irish literary establishment is not taking women seriously. Uh, I mean, the world literary establishment didn't for so long, that it was always about kind of straight white men. And that's changed, I think, a lot now. Um, straight white men seem to be on the outs, um, and it's, it's everybody else is now getting their, their chance, uh, which isn't a bad thing. And, um, but it was fun to write Maud. Uh, I like writing about writers, and she's, uh, she's as eccentric, I think, as, as writers get. I suppose it means that you're a country where uh, literature carries a lot of weight. Uh, um, we'd like to have that in Spain. Uh, now, I'd like to ask you a question. Is there something of John Boyne in the character, or at least in this phobia of Maud Avery, um, <clears throat> this phobia of success? Can you relate to that? I mean, you've, you've had a, a great success as a writer. Is there something of that in you, or are you happy to be successful? No, I, I mean, for me, the important thing is um, readers. Um, you know, I want to feel that the books I'm writing are, are, are being read and I'm not sort of writing into a void. So, no, I, I, I really value and treasure every reader who, who buys one of my books or contacts me or comes to a festival event. Um, I, I'm completely different than Maud in that sense. And anybody who wants to buy a book, I say thank you. <laughs> Do 
John, there's something else that you can uh, deduce from the book is that you continue to believe in, in goodness, in, in benevolence. There's a great benevolence in a lot of the, uh, the, the characters. There are some who are extremely cruel. There are some villains in, in, the, in the story. But there's a great goodness uh, and, and love uh, in, in, in the protagonist, above all. Do you continue to believe in goodness and benevolence in this world? I do. I think I'm quite an optimistic person. And I think if I, you know, if you stay off social media for the most part and just live your life in the real world, then um, people generally are kind and thoughtful. Um, we've all had, I'm sure I have, I'm sure you have, and all the people watching have had bad moments in life um, but, and people who've treated us poorly. But in general, I think people are, are, are kind and thoughtful. And certainly in the world in which I live, which is kind of a literary world and an artistic world, people tend to be, um, you know, thoughtful people. And I think it's, even if I'm wrong, I think it's a nicer way to go through life is sort of believing in the goodness of others. Yes, yeah, I'm sure it is a much nicer way to go through life. Now, Charles, who's a sort of ridiculous character, uh, the, the adoptive uh, father of Cyril, the main character, you know, there's sort of Carbo Kartak's character figures. That, uh, now, he says monogamy is not a natural state for, uh, for man. And when I say man, I mean man or woman. There's no sense to be chained sexually to the same person for 50 or 60 years. Now, I think this is attractive from a literary point of view. Now, my last novel does uh, ask this question. And in Hearts Invisible Fury, this, these words are spoken by a heterosexual, the heterosexual and womanizing uh, adopted uh, father of Cyril, who then has a long uh, monogamous relationship. So, John, what does Cyril think about promiscuity? Uh, I think he's growing up in a time where the only way to have sex at all is to be promiscuous because you can't form a relationship. You're not going to be going out for dinner with your partner. You're not going to be going to the cinema with your partner. Um, you're, par like you're, you're simply going to be having sex with strangers, mostly. Um, so he has no issue with it, but I think he would like to form a, a lasting relationship. And I think most of us, when we're younger, no matter whether you're straight or gay, um, most of us kind of, you know, play the field a little bit when we're young. But uh, a point comes where you, you, you value the idea of somebody being at home with you and, um, you know, just watching a movie together and eating dinner together and having kind of a nice uh, family life where you feel tr um, safe and um, that somebody cares about you and you care about them. So I think that's a kind of a natural state for anybody, no matter what their sexuality is. The Hearts and Invisible Furies, um, I'm sure you've understood this from the conversation we've had so far, that it's a, a melancholy, painful uh, story, although it does make you really want to live life. It has this bright side of a life lived with intensity and, and fullness. But at the end of the novel, Cyril says, when I look back on my life, I don't understand it. It seems that it I should have just been sincere with everyone. But that's not how I felt at the time. Back then, everything was different. That's true. But on the other hand, we know, John, that we... Living is never easy. Now, we always say that young people have it easier, and I'm, I'm sure they do. But still, life is never easy. Would you like to have had Grinder in your uh, in your youth? Oh, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't really like kind of social media apps very much. Um, I think I would have just liked to have had the freedom to form healthier relationships than the relationships that I did form. I think I was well into my 30s before I was... Um, really kind of forming healthy romantic relationships. And I think those that I made in my late teens or my early 20s uh, were not necessarily um, good for me and probably had quite a negative effect 
on me over time. But look, you know, that's life. I'm, I don't live in the past, really. And um, you, you, you just sort of you live the life you live. So. One of the last things I'd like to, to talk about uh, in this novel is uh, an, another impression you have, or I had as a reader, is this almost magical achievement in transmitting this sense of fullness in life, of the sheer number of things that a person experiences over a lifetime. Now, as I said at the beginning, the novel starts in 1945, and then there are seven-year intervals right up to 2015. And when I was reading the novel, I remembered a psychological experiment that was done in the university where they asked people, what do you think your life will be in 10 years' time? And these were people of a certain age, you know, from, from 30-something, 40. They, we, they asked, what do you think your life will be in 10 years' time? And most people said, there's going to be no major changes. I've got my job, my partner. My life is pretty much sorted. And then afterwards, they asked them, how has your life changed over the last 10 years? And then they realized, well, yes, there's been a lot of changes. They'd uh, changed city, they'd, they'd moved home, they'd, uh, they'd changed their partner, or they'd changed their job three times, or they published their first book <laughs> if they were, wanted to be writers. Now, when you read The Heart's Invisible Furies, I have this sort of sense that a lot of things happen in a lifetime, in pretty much everyone's life. Even in the most you know, simple people, a lot of things happen in their lives. So I'd like to ask you something. John, what do you think your life will be in 10, ten years or seven years? And why did you use this, uh, choose this number seven? Um, well, seven, I used the number seven just because, um, you know, 70 years seemed like, you know, 10 chapters, 70 years seemed like a, a decent stretch. And between 1940, like, I could st start at the end of the war and finish at the the equal rights marriage referendum, which is a 70 year gap between them. So that worked nicely. Um, and my life 10 years from now, um, I like, I actually have a life that I'm very happy with, really, you know, I, I love my, I love writing, I love reading, I have a wonderful family and friends and partner and um, I don't want much more out of life. Uh, I. Uh, you know, if you'd asked me 20, 30 years ago, would I be happy with what I have now? I would have said yes. And I'm not somebody who's constantly striving for more. I guess I, I want to always try to write better books each time. And um, but I it's not that I'm not ambitious. It's that I'm content and I feel satisfied with where I am in, in my life. And um, now, just like there's a uh, a phrase that from Gabriel Garcia Marquez that's attributed to him, but perhaps uh, it comes from someone else originally, and it says, "Writers write so that people love us more." Now that may be the case, and if it is, I'd like to say that you've definitely achieved that. I'd read your novels before, and I read this novel. Uh, with uh, absolute devotion, I have to say, that I love you more, having read that novel. And throughout the novel, I often felt the need or the will to give Cyril a hug, which is a way of embracing the author, John Boyne, as well. Sometimes, because of your ability to move us, other times, the, with the, because of the lucidity with which you express ideas in narrative form. But this desire, this need to, to embrace you, to give you a hug, is, is really something I felt very much in the, in the final author's note, uh, right at the end, in which John Boyne talks with absolute sincerity 
about a part of his life, um, with what uh, talks about what drove him to write this novel. Uh, he said that he loved Jason Donovan, and uh, <laughs> and this is a nice closure to the novel, because the Invisible Furies of the the Heart is a beautiful novel, very complete and full of desire and love. Now. Could you tell us if this novel was there within you for a long time or, or came to you as you were writing it? Oh, all my novels really come to me as I'm writing them. I start with an idea or a character and I just let the novel build before me. I, I don't like plotting in advance um, and I don't like to know too much about it in advance. I just, I trust myself that if I start, it will, it will you know, it, it will find the right direction. So, um, yeah, no, that's the way that I, that I always work. And I find it an exciting way to work as a writer. And this uh, note that you wrote, did that come at the end of the novel, the, the, the author's note at the end? Or how did that arise? Porque la novela... um, for um, a specific edition and I, I don't not, not every publisher in every country has used that but um some wanted to it was just yeah just my sort of note about you know my own experiences growing up um in a you know different time to Cyril and and how they shaped me as a person as a writer um and um so it's it's uh it's it's separate to the novel really but um it, it's not in all editions but I'm I'm, I'm glad it's in the Spanish one Well, I'd like to say to uh, all of the people who are following us and streaming, uh, the, the first thing they have to do is go out and buy uh, the Hearts and Dribble Furies. Give it as a gift. Uh, read it yourself. Uh, now, as I said at the beginning, we're now, uh, it's uh, Gay Pride now. and uh, But it's not just about uh, buying books during this uh, week or month. Rather, it's, it's something we should buy them always. It, but they, these uh, uh, books that are not only very enjoyable, but as good books do, they, they, they serve as a sort of mirror to ourselves to, to really make order out of chaos, to clear things up. Now I'd like to uh, invite uh, John to come to Spain as much as you can. Once we can, once we're able to, I can't wait. Yeah. Well, we'd uh, love to receive you here. And... Uh, and I'd like to, to give you the last word to, to close this. Oh, well, just to say thank you for, for uh, this interview and thank you to everybody watching. And um, I hope you do get a chance to read the book. And if you do, um, I'd love to know what you think of it. I, you know, despite what I say, I have a Twitter account and um, you, can, you can let me know. But I, I, uh, I look forward to seeing you in Spain, hopefully soon. Thanks very much to you.